On Fox Business Alert, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke is changing a few things, saying the Fed will start issuing more economic forecasts than Alan Greenspan ever did. That might be an easy thing to do. And improve communication with Wall Street. That will definitely be an easy thing to do from where Alan Greenspan was. Adam Shapiro with all the details. Adam? Good afternoon, David. This is a lot like that scene in The Wizard of Oz where the dog pulls the curtain aside and the guy says, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Ben Bernanke is pulling the curtain aside and saying, pay attention, folks. Look at what we're doing and understand the process by which we make decisions, those decisions being how the Fed determines whether it's going to cut interest rates or raise interest rates. And what Mr. Bernanke is saying is they're now going to put out every quarter projections from the FOMC, the uh, Federal Open Markets Committee, on the economy, whether they think it will grow or slow on unemployment and on inflation. Big key here is inflation. And they're going to raise those projections instead of being for just two years to three years. The bottom line on all this is to make it easier to understand. The communication strategy of the Federal Reserve is a work in progress. I believe that the changes announced by the FOMC today are an important advance. The changes will provide a more timely insight into the committee's outlook will help households and businesses better understand and anticipate how our policy decisions respond to incoming information and will enhance our accountability for the decisions we take. And Mr. Bernanke is hoping that by doing this, the Fed will offer some stability to the financial markets as people now look even further out as to what the FOMC, the 12 people who make up that committee, are actually thinking when they meet and decide whether or not they're going to be cutting rates. By the way, we're going to get the first of these expanded projections. We're going to get that next week, and we're going to see actually what they are thinking as far as what we can expect in the next two to three years for this economy. David? All right, so that'll solve all economic problems. It's all that of simple. them, right yeah. away. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> so are the changes announced by Bernanke a good idea? Jim Petakakis of U.S. News and World Report, along with Peter Schiff, author of Crash Proof. Join us now to discuss it. Uh, Jim, I'll start with you. These efforts to kind of make things more transparent, is that a good thing? Do you think it'll work? Uh, you know, I, I think I think it is a good thing. I mean, I think we can all remember when Alan Greenspan was head of the Fed and he'd go before Congress and he'd be up there, you know, for a couple of hours giving testimony. And then at the end of a couple of hours, you didn't know what the heck he just said. He, he had to be like one of those criminologists or something kind of tearing through his his testimony to figure out what he thought about the economy. And what the Fed does is important. Uh, as a, as a Chairman Bernanke said, uh, people plan, make decisions based on what they think the Fed's going to do. Uh, Wall Street makes decisions based on what the Fed's going to do. So if they have a better idea what the Fed is going to do, uh, then that might make end up uh, creating more rational decision making by, by both business, businesses and investors. So I do think it's a good thing. And Peter, I, I shouldn't be too flippant about it because it's true that the Fed does have a lot of information, more information than we have on which it bases its decisions. Well, I'm sure that they do, but if you look at their economic forecasts that they've made in the past, they have a pretty bad track record. Understood, but wouldn't you like to have access to more information? It never hurts, right? Well, I, you know, I, I think we get more disinformation coming out of the government and the Fed. I just like to get my information in the markets. I like to see what's actually happening, not what the government tries to convince me is happening. But don't you think, well, Peter, that, that... Go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. Was, but, 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 since, but since the Fed is going to act on what their forecasts are, what their models are saying, mm -hmm. and their decisions will influence, uh, you, know, uh, you know, interest rates, the economy going forward, I mean, I, I would like to know what they're going to do so I can plan in advance. Now, you can look at other yeah, well, things, I, too, like Peter does. I mean, Peter looks at gold. He probably looks at, uh, you know, Treasury bond yield, all kinds of things. But w one element of all that is what the Fed does. I would like to know. Peter wouldn't, Peter, wouldn't you rather have more information than less, whether well, you discount I get, it? I, mean, I get plenty of information. I'd rather have the government be honest and more straightforward. I think one of the reasons Alan Greenspan used to be so subtle is because I don't think he wanted anybody to know what he really believed. I think he wanted to talk in, in, you know, in secret. So I don't think could, so. I think Alan Greenspan didn't want to affect the markets. Whether that works for all of us, I'm not exactly yeah, sure. But I, I, just, I don't think he wanted to let on. I think Alan Greenspan and I have a lot more in common as far as what we believe in economically than people think. And I think Alan Greenspan realized the problems that we were in, and he didn't want to telegraph that. Jim, you agree? 
Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure what I'm not sure what problems he's uh, uh, referring to. Since uh, I mean, during the Alan Greenspan uh, era at the Fed, I mean, the economy overall did. Well, get, good, let's so let's sure just go back to Peter about. for a second. Peter, give us a for instance. For instance, well, what was he lying well, about? Well, look at the you. well. I mean, look at the book that he wrote. I mean, Alan Greenspan knew that he was facilitating a credit bubble. He knew that we had a growing current account deficit and a trade deficit that ultimately were going to be a big problem. He knew that we had a lack of domestic. So savings. he wants the United States to fail. That's your point. No, he doesn't want it to fail. So but why would he come out with these lies if he knew that, they, that he was keeping terrible information from the American because people? Because what they're trying to do is, for political reasons, you know, we, we were able to pretend that everything was okay. We had this artificial economy based on spending borrowed money. And for a while, everybody on Wall Street was making money, and consumers were spending money, and politicians were getting reelected. And he just didn't want to, you know, rain on that parade. You know, it was one of you the know, other I, things, I, Jim, one of the other things yeah. that, uh, Al, that uh, Ben Bernanke discussed today was that he is considering looking more at the headline consumer price index number, which gives us an indication of inflation at the consumer level, versus the so-called core rate, which eliminates the, the so-called often volatile food and energy prices. But, of course, we all eat food and we all use gasoline. That's right. What do you think about right. that? Right. Well, I mean, the Fed does have, an infl uh, have a mandate to, to pay attention to inflation. And for the average person, uh, right, who, who does drive a car, who goes to the store, uh, when those prices go up, it, it affects you. Now, uh, as far as whether the Fed acts or not, I think what the Fed's still going to really pay attention to is that core rate, uh, which excludes those things which tend to be very volatile and they can shift a lot from month to month because the Fed doesn't want to get whipsawed. It wants to look at data which it thinks uh, has some stability that, to it. That's, so, yeah, so yeah, but, it does, but the Fed wants to act at least like it's in touch with the concerns of uh, average Americans who, as you said, uh, are affected by these, uh, those top-line numbers. Okay, okay. gentlemen, that's gentlemen, we've got a break for some breaking news right now. We'll be back. Well, fo another Fox Business alert. A controversial plan to give driver's licenses to illegal immigrants has died a quick death. A question about the proposal got Hillary Clinton in some trouble in the last presidential debate. And now New York Governor Elliot Spitzer is dropping the idea that he proposed. Is that a good thing for the economy? We're going to throw that question out to our panel. Mike Norman, founder of Economic Contrarian Update. Jim Petakakis, once again, from U.S. News and World Report. We have Nicole Ridgway from SmartMoney.com. And Peter Schiff of Euro Pacific Capital and author of Crash Proof. Welcome to all of you. Mikey, you take this one first. What do you think? It, it's an unpopular subject. Most of the public are against the illegal immigrants being here. The problem is they're here, so they're being a little bit naive. We've got to come to a solution. It would have been great if they came here legally, the 11 or 12 million that are here. They are not. The other thing I think where there's a bit of naivete is that this country's economic future is going to be highly dependent on immigration. Again, we need an immigration policy. There's no question. For the ones that are here right now, 11 to 12 million, let's say there was a mistake. Somehow they got in here illegally. I think it's probably better to document them, to know where they are, to keep, you know, uh, tabs on them. With driver's uh, licenses. To, with dri you know, whatever method, with driver's licenses, but to know where they are, to document them, to have yeah. uh, right. oversight Peter, over them. Peter, look, I love immigrants. I married an immigrant. I, I have immigrants in my family, but at the same time, what the immigrants who are here illegally are often doing with these driver's licenses, and let's not forget that a number, I think the majority of the 9-11 hijackers had legitimate driver's licenses even though they weren't here properly. Uh, what they're doing with these driver's licenses should not be done by illegal immigrants. That's yeah. the problem. Well, I think, you know, you send a real mixed message. On the one hand, you want people to respect their immigration laws, but then you hand out uh, licenses to people who knowingly violated them. I mean, I believe we should have more immigration, but I do believe it should be legal. And I think we should reform the magnets and the problems of immigration is the social welfare state. The problem is we dole out too much money to people who come across the border. You know, back in the turn of the century, we had the big immigration wave when my grandparents came here from Europe. You know, when they came to Ellis Island, there was nobody from the Welfare Department. Uh, they just showed up and went and got a job. And there were no government benefits. There was no safety in it. We want to encourage uh, immigrants to come in and work hard, but we don't want to put them on the government dole. And that's been the problem. Let me focus this back to the original question, Nicole, and that is, will it hurt the economy if these people can't get driver's licenses to continue doing work in contracting, in landscaping, etc.? Well, I, I don't necessarily think it's going to hurt the economy in the respect that I don't think a lot of illegal immigrants are probably going to come out of the woodwork to get these licenses in the first place because it is a big scarlet letter on them. You know, like they can be tracked down. And if you're an illegal immigrant who can't afford 
to, you know, pay the legal fees and do all this stuff to get to go through the proper channels to get a green card, say, you know, you're going to try to stay, um, you know, as in the shadows as much as possible. Now, that said, you know, a lot of our economy, we do rely very heavily on immigrant workers. So, you know, whether or not this this driver's license policy is that in heavily, place. But Right. And Jim, Jim Petakakis, the thing, the reason why this plan was uh, derided and why perhaps it was eventually pulled was if I'm an illegal immigrant and I have a chance to get a pretty good looking fake document or a legitimate document saying that I'm an illegal alien, I'm going to choose the fake, right? Well, well, you know the uh, you know the, uh, the you know the driver's license is really serves as our national ID card. And if you can get that, even if there's something on it that says this is a, this is a different tier of driver's license and it's not used for identification, uh, de facto it is going to be used for identification. So you've created then a document which can be kind of a breeder document to get all these uh, all these other documents which can be used to get on airplanes and so forth. I want if I could just quickly get back to what Nicole said. Uh, one of the great myths uh, of, of the illegal immigration debate is somehow we need all this low skill labor and, and we really don't um, we need a lot of we need immigration we need high skill immigrants that's great but the actual economic impact of low skill immigration is very minimal I know people are going to say who's going to pick all the vegetables and fruits but you know what if, if those wages went up you could you could get Americans to do that or more likely you're going to mechanize Jim. that you will mechanize that just as they've done in Europe that is a huge myth I mean if you want and illegal immigrants will rise. for political and cultural reasons, fine, but it's not an economic case. Mike. No, Jim is right. I mean, it's not an economic case. And I mean, we might end up paying more for fruits and vegetables, and some food prices Minimally. might rise minimally. And But you would create a market for, uh, you know, a demand for uh, American workers. Okay. Um, so I think he's right in that point. All right. Well, starting next year, the first. Thanks for covering that for us. Hidden behind all the rhetoric, and there's a lot of that, I yeah, think, there is. over estate taxes debate could be the biggest question of all. Can we afford to do anything about it? Our lawmakers already counting on all that revenue. Our Fox panel back to discuss, and we welcome your Urin Brook from the Ayn Rand Institute. Urin, thank you very much. Let, let me go to you first. Uh, what about the, the argument? I'm not sure where I'm supposed to be. There we are. What about the argument, Euron, that, that this country needs a kind of economic mobility that it doesn't have? That is, where rich, rich folks get poor, poor folks get richer, et cetera. How do you argue, argue that? I, I, I mean, I think it's interesting because just, uh, just this week, uh, a study was published by the Treasury Department that looked at uh, wealth mobility in the United States. And, and wealth mobility is quite robust today in the U.S. Uh, uh, people in the low, lowest income groups seem to be rising to the middle class and upper middle class, and sometimes so it's already into the happening. rich categories. It's already happening. Uh, you know, and and the, the more fundamental here is Warren Buffett talks about wealth as if it's some kind of it's owned by society. Wealth is owned by individuals, and those individuals should have a right to dispose of that wealth any way they choose to. He has chosen to give thirty something billion to the Bill Gates Foundation without going through uh, the tax mechanism in Washington. He's not going to take to pay any taxes on that $34 billion. I want to leave all my wealth to my children. It's none of Washington's business what I do with my wealth. They taxed it once already when, it was, when, the, when the wealth was created, when the wealth was made. Leave it alone. Let me decide how to dispose of it. Mike Norman, whether you agree with how politicians run the country on the money they get from our taxes, Warren Buffett brought up an example where he said Leona Helmsley's dog was left twelve yeah. million dollars from her estate. Now, if they repealed the state tax, the dog would have gotten twenty-two million, and the tax coffers are down about ten million. So, what do you well, think about look, Warren Buffett's I have concept? To, I have to agree with Warren Buffett only because I don't want there to be a Norman aristocracy in this country. Oh. Lord help <laughs> as that. much as I would like to have it. No, just kidding. By the way, I think his example of the, the football example he gave. That's silly because, look, the money you make, that's private property. If you own that university, you certainly can, you know, if you're the football coach and you own that university, you could make your son be the, the next quarterback or whatever. The, uh, the fans will uh, smack you. But. Well, look, it's private property. But um, I do agree with Warren Buffett. I don't think we have to create a plutocracy in this nation. I think there is something to be said for you know, dispersing that wealth. And um, I think the revenues to the government, and go ahead, call me it. 
Call me. No, no, I'm going to go to Nicole. Nicole the Socialist, go ahead, call me. I'm not going to call you socialist. I'm not going to call you socialist. But, Nicole, the point is, as Euron was saying, we have this incredible social economic mobility in this country already. The rich usually don't hold on to their family, to their, to their money throughout their generations. They give it back, and the poor folks come up and replace them. I mean, I think I was listening to Ben Stein earlier, and he suggested that they actually raise the exemption levels maybe to like 10, 20 million. Right. Yeah. Um, and to me, that seems sort of like one of the best sort of scenarios here. Compromise. A, a compromise that would actually get through yeah. and make sense. Peter Schiff, what do you think? Well, you know, two things. First, I think the estate tax is a highly destructive tax economically. It makes it very difficult for entrepreneurs uh, to pass on their businesses to it only their children. It 12,000 people, Peter. Well, I'm, well, I'm saying entrepreneurs, if you're making a, a, an investment and, and you want to make capital investments, you're going to be inhibited from doing so if your children are going to be forced to liquidate uh, that business to pay the taxes. But more importantly, the legal aspects, I'm very troubled by the legal immorality here. You know, in order to tax estates, inheritance, what the government has done is they've levied an excise tax on the privilege of, uh, of leaving your assets to your heirs. Now, it's not really a privilege. It's a right. If I own something, I have a right to give it away. But the government pretends it's a privilege only because that's the only way they can constitutionally tax it. Because they're not levying a direct tax on the gift. They're levying an excise tax of the privilege of leaving your assets to your heirs. And that's a phony privilege. It's a right. If I own you know, something, for, I have a right to give 19, it away. Quickly, quickly, from quickly. From 1946 until 1980, the average tax for the top... Uh, uh, income bracket was about 88 percent. We created thousands, hundreds of thousands of businesses, so it did not stifle right. innovation Mike, or entrepreneurship. Mike, there were so many deductions. In Washington, D.C., that. some surprising... Well, Congress already is getting involved in the subprime mortgage mess. The House Financial Services Committee approving a measure that puts new regulations on the lenders. But will this measure actually help homeowners facing foreclosure, like it's intended to do? Or will it make things even tougher for people trying to get a mortgage? We're joined again by Euron Brook of the Ayn Rand Institute and Peter Schiff, author of Crash Proof. Euron, uh... If the government were to get involved, does it help the average homeowner who's facing foreclosures or will it hurt and it will end up helping the lawyers and perhaps people who got themselves into this case? Well, like most uh, government, uh, government intervention, this is going to help the lawyers. It's going to be a huge boon for lawyers and it's going to hurt both the industry and the borrowers. It's going to drive up interest rates. It's going to reduce the amount of capital available for mortgages. It's going to hurt primarily uh, future borrowers in the subprime markets, future low-income families who would like to borrow uh, in order to purchase a house, those loans are not going to be available because what this law provides is that borrowers who, after they can't pay their bills, feel like the lender gave them a loan that they shouldn't have, or by definition they shouldn't have because they can't now pay their bills supposedly, can sue not only the lender, but they can sue the person who bought the securitized the security based on that mortgage. So the, the whole chain from the lender to the bank to the hedge fund maybe that now owns the security, all of those are now liable supposedly for, you know, for being irresponsible in making this loan. And you know, I'm not going to buy a security uh, on a mortgage if I'm going to be, if somebody can sue me for supposedly the lender being irresponsible. So, so Peter, this clearly is, is a case of overregulation. Of course, we should mention that this is just a proposal. These things get bashed together. Both sides have very stringent proposals, and then they come together well, with some you know, sort of compromise. Do you think we'll see one, a reasonable one? Well, you know, we're not going to get anything reasonable out of the government. You know, they always try to close the barn door after the horse has left. You know, uh, lending standards are going to come back. These are going to, these disciplines are going to be imposed by the free market. We don't need them to be legislated. It's going to be more difficult for Americans to borrow money to buy homes. It needs to be. The problem was it was too easy in the past, but the market is going to correct this. You know, the government created this problem. They blew up the housing bubble in the first place. They need to stay away. And I can tell you, as one of the few people who not only forecast the housing bubble, but the stock market bubble in advance and warn people, we're just getting started. Real estate prices are going a lot lower. There's a lot more foreclosures to come. It's not just subprime. It's all day. It's prime mortgages. Okay. This is early in it, and the government needs to stay out because they're just going to make it worse. Well, you're on. You're on. Let me just remind you what President Bush said to David yesterday about all of this. And in essence, he was saying that, yes, uh, there should be some intervention, but to help encourage lenders 
to get together. It didn't seem to me, David, and you were the one who was there, I mean, that, that he was basically saying that there should be government intervention, but in essence asking the lenders to meet up with the home. Right, owners. and you're on one, one thing that the president was suggesting, which I think you'll agree with, that if you are refinancing, if you're one of these homeowners that's really stuck and you're refinancing, you can't make the payments, you shouldn't have to pay taxes on the refinance, which you do now. He's trying to eliminate tax payments on the refinance. Is that good or not? I'm always, I'm always for uh, cutting taxes. Uh, you know, I wish it was a broader tax cuts and just specialized tax cuts when particular people happen to be in trouble. The problem is here that there was too much lending, there was too much borrowing. The lenders are really suffering. Uh, many banks, mortgage banks, out of business. Clearly, Citibank, Merrill Lynch, a lot of people are suffering the consequences. And of course, many of the borrowers are suffering. But they have to take responsibility for the fact that they took on loans that they shouldn't have taken on. They couldn't. They bought homes that they couldn't afford, and we need to let them suffer the consequences of those bad decisions. It's not you know, the job of the government. The government's not responsible for bailing people out for bad decisions, particularly when it was the government that induced this behavior to begin with, with, with interest rates that are too low, with the Community Reinvestment Act that encourages banks to lend money to exactly this, this group that, that can't afford these homes. Uh, with Freddie May and you know Freddie Mac that that uh, guarantee some of these loans, uh, you know the government has created this problem. The best way to resolve it yeah. is to step back and let the market take yeah. care of it. Remember, the biggest it problems are, are faced by the lenders. They're the ones that loan people money. Many people who bought these homes didn't use any of their money. They they bought with nothing down. That was the problem. So the real losses are going to be borne by the lenders, and they're going to go on their own and try to renegotiate deals with the borrowers. And I think the borrowers have the upper hand here because they. They have put options. The borrowers can walk away from these mortgages. There are plenty of houses on the market they, that they can rent. So there's going to be a lot of market-based incentives uh, for the lenders to renegotiate. We don't need the government trying to dictate that. This is going to happen on its own. But one thing that homeowners are going to lose is the illusion of home equity. And people are going to realize that homes are not investments. They're consumer goods. You buy a home, it's, a, it's an expenditure. It's not a cash machine. And people are going to have to reevaluate well, what housing machine, is. That's for sure. It's not one now. Anyway, gentlemen, we've got to wrap it to that. By the way, I just want to look at the, can we look at uh, Euron's again, hit the background in Euron? The background, there it is. Now turn around, Euron. Turn around. <laughs> Is that was that landscape made by Howard Rourke? <laughs> I have a green screen behind me, so oh, I have no okay. clue what you're talking about. Magical oh. <laughs> television ruined by David Asman. Oh, well. good Thank going. you, gentlemen. Good to see you both. Well, the countdown is on to the closing bell. Well, we were going to say no wild swings in the market today, but it's it's not a wild swing, but it got negative pretty quickly. Yeah, we're down about 74 points. So we've just lost in the blink of an eye about 35 points because we were already down double digits. So right now mm -hmm. we're going to ask the question, what comes next? Will the next big move we all know will be coming, will it be to the upside or the downside? Our Fox panel back to talk about it once more, along with, of course, the woman in the center of the action, Tracy Burns, live from the New York Stock Exchange. Tracy, first let's get to you because now we're down about 78 points. What happened? What's moving this down? Yeah, this is just end of the day. People, more panic selling. People don't want to go home long, so to speak, meaning the traders don't want to be holding anything. They're not sure what's going to happen overseas. You know, we came in today with pretty good um, numbers from overseas. We did well overseas while we were sleeping because don't forget, everything trades while we're still sleeping. So stocks like China Mobile did really well today. You know, this market today was chock full of news, and yet the market was just like, eh, did nothing. As a result, we were flat for most of the day, you know, yet we had retail numbers, but they were eh, too. We had the PPI come out, but again, nobody, that was no news to anybody. Bernanke speaks, kind of nothing happened all day. And it's all because of, as we talked about earlier, we have options expiration week going on this week. That means any trader that holds an option has to exercise it on Friday. So if he's got an option to buy a stock at a particular price, he's got to do that on Friday. If he's got an option to sell at a particular place, he's got to do that too. So that means Friday is going to be your lightning loops roller coaster ride. Mm -hmm. Between now and then, I think we're going to hang out. And I mean, we definitely had stuff happen. You know, we had news from Bear Stearns that they're going to take this big fat $1.2 billion right off and that should be it for now you know all right. Well, it is now, by the way, just so you know, Tracy and Jim Petacakis, I'm sure you're looking at this. It's down triple digits now. 
Uh, of course, it was it was way up triple digits. It still has uh, has a long way to go negative before it equals yesterday's gains. But what's going on in your eyes, Jim? <laughs> well, what's going on is that investors are shaky. I mean, the last month in the markets, they've been given the you know the real Jack Bauer treatment. I mean, they've been tortured you know, with all this credit crunch stuff, more bad housing news. Uh, so at this point, it's not going to take much uh, you know for the market to sell off. But I tell you, I think the big story. Uh, heading into 2008 and in 2008 is going to be this economy reaccelerating and this market moving off from these lows. The market's actually, I think, very inexpensive right now, and there's a lot of room on the upside. Okay, let me, since the Dow is now down 100 points, Mike yeah. Norman, uh, let me just tell you that Disney is getting hammered. It's down about three and three quarters of a percent. Uh, AT&T is not doing well either. It's down one and a half percent. We're seeing Intel, Exxon Mobil. A lot of red on the screen, but uh, what, what do you read from that? You had a 320-point up day yesterday. As Jim mentioned, there are still lingering concerns. However, the good news is that uh, we continue to see a lot of these companies, Bear Stearns, Merrill Lynch, announcing pretty much their, their, their final round of write-downs, at least for now. Uh, the other thing I think that needs to be restated is that the Fed is going to be there. This is not going to be a meltdown. The Fed will provide a, a, a foundation for both the economy and the market. Look, we saw good news out of Walmart. Uh, which is great. It portends possibly a decent uh, holiday shopping season. The consumer is absolutely not out of the picture. Right. Very strong contribution point. to GDP in the third quarter. Even if it's mediocre in the fourth quarter, we have booming exports, booming exports now overtaking even the contribution from consumption. So I, I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity. You have to think, why are you laughing? I'm laughing because I heard Peter Schiff in my ear saying, let me argue with him. Go ahead, Peter. Well, you know, the market's going lower. I, this is a bear market. Yeah, I would, I would sell. Peter's smiling? Sm I love this. We don't ever see Peter <laughs> show us. Peter, you know, do that more often. Your orthodontist but, is so happy right now. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's because the stuff I own is going up today. But, you know, you, you, you got to get out of this market. If you, you, gotta, if you want to go to cash, fine, but not dollars. I would suggest maybe the Swiss franc. If you want to be invested, Swiss there are plenty franc. of opportunities around the world. I'm fully invested <laughs> in foreign yeah. stocks. There's the foreign markets, the foreign economies are in much better shape shape. There's good dividends to be had in appreciating currencies. Gold's going a lot higher. You can buy gold. You can buy other commodities. But get out of stocks. They're hey, going a lot be, lower. There are a lot of problems. You must be a, a riot at home around the dinner table at <laughs> night, my friend. I mean, what do you say to your kids, kids? This country's going down the drain to hell in a handbasket. My well, God. Uh, well, at least, I, at at least, least I've Jim been... Rogers is moving to China. Alec Baldwin <laughs> threatened it. He never did it. I don't know. Yeah, but, but at least I'm making money for my kid to inherit. Oh, hopefully, okay, I don't, okay, hopefully, we don't okay. lose it all to the the estate oh, tax, yeah. but uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you yeah. feed your kids, Mike, with all that bad uh, investment advice. Right. Well, Peter, you have to Peter, you brought it back tax. to the beginning. God bless you. He went full circle. We started estate tax. tax exactly. We ended estate tax. The final minutes before the closing bell. Yeah, the Dow's suffering right now, down about 91 points. We will be right back with all the action, so don't go away. This is Fox Business.